together to execute their own people? We had authority. If we found collaborators in any of the villages around us, to kill them, to shoot them. Of communist revolutionaries and a hidden network of spies. You thought, am I going to die with a bullet through me? You know, you didn't know. You didn't know. In this series, we'll discover how this country was transformed from a green and pleasant land into a bristling fortress. And find out if Britain could have repelled a Nazi invasion. We're British, and the British don't lose anything. Manning these defences was a new force, the Home Guard. This is the story of the real Dad's army. In Britain's darkest hour, there was a force that had to man the beaches against German panzer divisions and crack paratroopers. Stand out. Try and get it right. Try and stand out. Eat! <laughs> and shut! <laughs> all right, sir. The men are all ready for your inspection. Dad's army has created an enduring myth. But were the Home Guard really as bumbling as the men from TV's Warmington on Sea? The creator of Dad's Army served for three years in the Watford Home Guard. There was always that sort of atmosphere of uh, slight amateurishness. But you see, us Brits, it's amateurs that always, in the end, win. Behind the humour of Dad's Army lies the untold story of a freedom fighter from the Spanish Civil War who promised to transform the Home Guard into a crack guerrilla unit. But the story begins in spring 1940. It took the Nazi panzer divisions just days to storm through France and northern Europe. The British army beat a desperate retreat towards the coast. On the home front, it was panic stations. Pretty much everybody in Britain was absolutely convinced that there was going to be a German invasion. It seemed pretty clear to the British that they must be next. I mean, uh, Hitler wouldn't stop at the Channel. Why should he? He'd had such great uh, success in a matter of weeks. Uh, surely there would be a plan uh, for a German invasion of England. And it would come any day. We did think that it was the real thing. We were going to be invaded, and we were getting ready to do it. I've spoken to women who've... Um, Ordinary housewives who said, um, I'm going up into the bedroom and I'm going to pour boiling water on them when they come past. It was quite obvious that the situation was absolutely critical. We were completely alone. And so at that period, everything was done to prepare for an invasion. A drastic measure was taken. Throughout Britain, every church bell was silenced. They would only be rung to signal that the invasion had started. It would be the loudest silence of the home front. Across the channel lay 40 German divisions. To tackle them, the British could muster just 30. These were scattered right across the country and were chronically understrength and underarmed. Vast expanses of Britain lay unguarded. So the government was forced into action. On the 14th of May, 1940, the Minister for War, Sir Anthony Eden, broadcast an extraordinary appeal on radio, calling for a new People's Army. We want large numbers of men in Great Britain who are British subjects between the ages of 17 and 65 to come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance doubly sure. The name of the new force, which is now to be raised, will be the local defence volunteer. The public response was staggering. The War Office expected a total of 150,000 recruits, but within 24 hours, a quarter of a million men had enlisted for the LDV, or the Home Guard, as they would soon become known. At the end of the broadcast, we all felt there was some hope that we could take a, a, a part, and maybe a, a dynamic part, in keeping our country free. There was a realisation that Hitler was something specially, impossibly evil. 
the government had hugely underestimated the numbers of volunteers, so local authorities were totally unprepared. Well, there was no one else in the police station, and the police sergeant obviously hadn't listened to the broadcast the following evening, probably was asleep, uh, and come on duty early in the morning. So he did his best. He wrote our names down on an envelope, literally. Did you get the enrolment form? No. Well, haven't they got any at the police station? They wouldn't let me have them without putting in a, an application form. Well, then why didn't you, sir? They haven't got any. Oh, I see. <laughs> I got those, however. Oh, but, but look here, yeah, these, these are paying in forms. Oh, sir. don't keep putting obstacles what? in the way, Wilson. <laughs> the very next day, after listening to the speech, I came to this spot, to the uh, old police station, and uh, there was a little bit of chaos about, and nobody seemed to know uh, what exactly was happening, but uh, uh, an officer eventually came and uh, took my name and, and placed it with others on a piece of paper, and then, then I came out. That was it, I joined. Couldn't wait to join the Home Guard. I was uh, 15 and three quarters when it the, the LDV was originally formed and my mother was I said I'll join because the young boys they can't wait to get killed that's why they have young boys as soldiers you don't know it isn't until you get in the real army in a real war you realize how horrible it is and I said to my mother I'm gonna join oh she said please don't please don't I said I've got to do my duty and you've got to remember we're talking now about an age that's gone forever when we were alone. The new recruits were formed into their own platoons, from factory workers and miners to stockbrokers and members of parliament. The character of the Home Guard was that people were too old to fight uh, in the armed forces and too young to join. So it was a very interesting group of people with a lot of experience but not quite their physical strength, and a lot of people with a lot of physical strength and no experience. And that was what made it so interesting. We are fit. I'm a pretty fair example of the material myself. We are prepared to form suicide squads, officers and all ranks together. The whole nation should be mobilized for action. Keep your hearts up. We know how to fight with our backs to the wall. Within six weeks, nearly one and a half million eager volunteers had enlisted. The government was totally overwhelmed. Now it had to arm and train this vast army. Before the war ended, a formidable guerrilla army would emerge. But first, the Home Guard will have to endure the Dad's Army days. I used to think it was pretty straightforward. You sorted out a pension and that was that. But now I read stuff and I'm thinking, is a pension enough? Should I be spreading the risk? Do I need to diversify my portfolio? I know one thing for certain, I'm totally confused. Make sense of investments with Norwich Union. Speak to a financial advisor. Evening Primrose Oil, only $1.99. That's a cool 63% off. You really can't afford to miss the better than half price sale. Now at Holland and Barrett. 118 is 24 7. Oh, hello, yes. Um, could you give me the number for a dog training school in Guildford, please? I'd particularly like one that does home visits. I'll text you. Text me. No, could you actually put me straight through? 118 24 7. Whatever you want, just yell. North East England, passionate people, passionate places, call now for your free holiday guide. savings account there are no catches and you can move your money when you like so you can relax with the world's leading direct savings bank call now or go online ing direct 
It's your money we're saving. Got the nappies? Yes. The milk, cuddly things, mm -hmm. bottle. Yep. And the push chair. Got it. You sure? I've got it. The new Nissan Note, because there's no bigger adventure than having kids. You're fired. Blunkett and the dog, you're fired. Kennedy, you're fired. Oaten, do me a favour. It's a tough life in politics. It's about to get tougher. The government had expected a total of 150,000 men to join the Home Guard. Within six weeks, ten times that number had volunteered. Now the war office faced their first problem, how to arm and train them. I signed up and uh, weren't allowed to have a, a, a weapon. I said, when do I get my rifle? When do I get it? Can we get my hands on it? Our weapons and uniforms are oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Captain Mannering, sir. Yes, still long. I think I know what you've come for. Just signed there, sir. Yes. Sergeant, call the men in outside to help her load. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, sir. What? Here are your uniforms. And your weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good Lord. Pepper. Pepper? Pepper. Enemy for throwing in the face of. <laughs> Five feet. The new recruits thought they were joining a people's army, armed to the teeth. But all available weapons had been given to the British army, leaving precious little for the men of the Home Guard. By the left, quick march. There is a new army drilling in our midst, the Brumstick Army. Squads of keen young patriots who have waited for months their turn to be called up and are now voluntarily drilling with broomsticks instead of weapons. 65 years after they joined the Home Guard, these veterans can still remember their drill. Well, I first saw him, you know, with a, with a stick. Stick trying to, you know, left turn. You yeah, handed it to your partner because we hadn't all got brooms and that, but you just went in twos and threes. And then uh, he said, Oh, you two are all right, you two are all right, you do it again. And uh, you hand it over to him. Ah, oh, you can, yes, you're not just a bad squad. Halt! It was basic, you know, very, very basic. But uh, you've got to have something to, uh, to sort of do your stuff for when you've got the rifle. They promised us rifle, you see. By the left, dress. Move over, walking. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get my arms extracted. It was comical when I think about it. But we were serious. Stand up, east. You can't get guards, Bill, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in the early days, the Home Guard had very, very, very little with which to work. Uh, broomsticks with knives, uh, a lash to them weren't, weren't uncommon. Shotguns, yes, if uh, uh, somebody had them. Uh, but actual weapons uh, coming from 
the war office, very few and far between. The bullet-free phase soon ended, but when the government did start to issue rifles, there were rarely enough to go round. Over a month after they were formed, the Home Guard averaged just one rifle for every six men. Finally, after about three weeks, I got my rifle. Now, a rifle was a P-17, a P-14. They were American Army rifles used in the First World War, five shots in the, in the chamber. You carried them in your pocket. You didn't That's put them right. in the gun, not until the last minute, you know. And I went home with my rifle, and my mother opened the front door. Oh, she said, you, you can't bring that in the house. Oh, it's terrible. It's got to it. Got to be here, got to be on hand, all day and night. But these vintage weapons were hardly state of the art. I prided myself on being a, a, a crack shot, as I was. I could drive in a six inch nail, firing at the head only, in about four shots. Anyway, the, the bullseye was about two feet across, dead easy. Aimed at the center of the bullseye, pulled the gun. I was miles out, about four feet off. And it was not until I had the last bullet of my five in the clip and fired it, continually lowering the gun, lowering the gun, inch at a time, that I got down that I could hit this bullseye. Well, the sights, of course, were never fixed. Never fixed properly. It was useless, useless. Because they wouldn't have killed many Germans. <laughs> the newly formed Home Guard needed time to train and equip themselves. But they could be called into action sooner than expected. Just 12 days after the Home Guard was formed, the British began the desperate evacuation of their forces at Dunkirk. 68,000 British troops were killed or captured. Britain lay more exposed than ever. The south coast of England was now on the front line. Folkestone lay just 24 miles from the German forces in France. The War Office deployed Home Guard sentries all along the coastline. Their job, to keep watch for an invasion. Their military transport, the bicycle. The Germans soon moved up to the other side of the channel and it was rather a frightening thought to think that they were within sight. On a really clear day, one could see the cliffs of Cape Grenade just over there and uh, it didn't seem uh, all of that 25 miles, especially uh, when the sunlight would catch the windscreen of a vehicle coming up the cliff and you got a flash back from the other side. It really brought it home to one how close we were. Of course, we were in the front line down here and uh, I think all of us were very much aware that uh, at any time we could hear the warning go to say that the invasion had started. Despite their appalling lack of weapons, the Home Guard prepared for battle. The hand grenade, or Mills bomb, was standard issue for the regular army, but the Home Guard got to grips with a more basic alternative. You ready then? Yes, you've got your potato. Yeah. Are you ready for pushing the hand grenade? Left foot forward. Come on, Pin out. out. Back. Throw. Well, you didn't have the live ammunition, I didn't take the risk. So we'll be trained with potatoes to give us a good idea that when we got the live one, it was exactly nearly the same as having the grenade. Because the same shape as the hand grenade, and there's a pin in the top, and uh, that is the thing that you had to get your finger in. You pull the bomb back, and you put your hand in there to make sure the pin is in the hand. Now you know that the bomb now is alive. Hold the grip and then throw the bomb, two, three, four, and down. Out the way when it explodes. You could laugh at it now, looking back, throwing potatoes, you know. It was very, very serious at the time, really. Until the War Office could provide proper weaponry, the Home Guard would have to make do. Use your ingenuity to improvise gadgets which will increase the effectiveness of your arms. The God of Battles helps those who help themselves. Improvisation is one of the keys to success in battle. To tackle the invader, the Home Guard were taught to make their own homemade bombs. 
Basically, Molotov cocktail was a petrol bomb. Petrol in a bottle with a wick, bit of rag, light it, throw it. It would seem obvious that you don't sort of make up two dozen of these and then keep in the back room until, until you see tanks coming down the road because you could be there for a week. So you would be making it virtually on the spur of the moment. The thing was to have the thing ready or prepared and then armed with your wick and a lighter, right, where can I throw it? Finally, a dummy tank arrives on the scene and is very expeditiously handled. The crew, disguised tankists, are rounded up with realism and relish by the energetic home guard. Prime Minister Winston Churchill insisted that every man in the home guard must be armed. As there were still not enough rifles to go round, the war office distributed a new weapon in the fight against the Nazis. The pike. And here we have an example with, with a, a 1913 bayonet on the, welded on the end of a pipe, which could do a lot of damage to somebody poked in the stomach. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're talking about Agincourt now, where they stuck the huge stakes in the ground and the archers got behind it. Going out on a wet night and standing guard in a bridge, a bridge with a pike in your hand wasn't exactly the feeling that you've got the enemy at bay. Well, if I had to meet German paratroopers with it, well, I, I should be dead scared. It wouldn't take very much to, to just sort of to lunge forward and again uh, withdraw, and, and you, you got a little there, there, that's to let the blood out. We used to do bayonet training and they had sex with a face to look like Hitler on. All I can remember is trying to look aggressive, lunge forward and jab the, the steel in once, twice, and hopefully achieve the objective and quickly withdraw and bunk away. Now, the main thing, you've got to scream when you charge. And they say, get the bush here, after the time, and remember, they don't like it up on you, know. They do not like it up on <laughs> A quarter of a million pikes were produced, but the commanders were usually too embarrassed to distribute them. So, desperate to appease Churchill and the Home Guard, the War Office attempted to issue weapons that could tackle German panzer divisions. But all they could muster were eccentric prototypes and army rejects. They issued at one stage a spigot mortar which, in my opinion, was more dangerous to the operator than it was to the enemy, because they used to uh, fly back after exploding, and uh, I, I didn't like the things at all. Sticky bombs. They were dreadful. You, you pressed a catch, which opened up this metal bit, and you wandered up in a rather nonchalant man manner to the nearest German tank, and you stick it on. Now, when you press it against the tank, there's glass inside which breaks and that gives you eight seconds to get out of it. But you're not allowed to run away. You walk up, you stick it on. As soon as you've stuck it, you turn round and you walk away in an orderly fashion. This was to give you, you know, train you. You see, what people don't understand is when you've got lots of real stuff, People get bloody killed. As a 17-year-old in the Home Guard, Robert Bernard came face to face with tragedy very early in his young life. The uh, firing range had been improvised, and we had to put out guards because we knew that the rifle range was unsafe, and also there was no way of preventing people approaching, um, and obviously there was a good chance of an ex accident. So we put out guards, uh, well, I think only two, one of them was my friend, and we then fired, there were 12 of us, we fired the, the rifles, more or less accurately, nobody will ever know. But unfortunately, one of the rounds ricocheted off a stone or we've no idea what, and we don't know whose, and it hit my friend uh, around the midriff, and um, he bled to death. We didn't even miss him when we um, got up, packed up and went go off and, and then suddenly realised that he hadn't come in from his guard duty 
off the range. And uh, when we went to look, we found him uh, dead in a pool of blood. He'd, he'd died there. To this day, the family of the victim has not been told how he died. His identity still cannot be revealed. Amateur soldiers and poor weaponry was proving to be a dangerous cocktail. A man in the Home Guard was four times more likely to die in training than a regular soldier. Then, on the 16th of July, 1940, Hitler issued Directive 16, which ordered the Navy, Army and Air Force to prepare for a cross-channel invasion of Britain. The Home Guard were convinced that they were about to see action. I think the fighting came into it first, yeah. you know. And when I, I volunteered, I, I, I thought, well, uh, we're going to do something of this. And then you get some bright fat who, who, who wants to, to, to get you marching and things like that. Come up back. close and shout at you. What's what we doing this for? Let's get down to how to fire the gun, how to do this, that and the other, you know. Mm. But now that the Home Guard had been equipped, how were they going to take on the most formidable fighting force in the world? Many of the officers had learned strategy in the First World War. Called back into action, it was a dream come true for some armchair generals. I think our commanding officer resembled Captain Mannering. One of his basic ideas was his love of what was called pincer movements. Now, what a pincer movement was, was where groups of soldiery went round on the, on the flanks yep, and cut off the enemy. I think it was a Zulu tactic, actually, and they caught the, the horns of the bull, I think, who, you know, this was their approach. And, and his idea was, was, this is what we're going to do, man, you know, we're going to have one of these pincer movements, yeah, and we're going to entrap the entire German fighting force, and then all we need to do is just kill them all, as it were. Forgetting, the, totally forgetting that on the opposite side of the perimeter were your own men. But we practiced these games on some wasteland, complete with lumps of brushwood, so that the enemy couldn't see you moving about. Tactics. Strong word, that tactics. I don't think we really had any. <laughs> with no guidance from the War Office on training or tactics, Home Guard units devised their own elaborate battle plans to take on columns of German tanks. Alan Laurie was a 19-year-old student studying history at Cambridge University. The job that uh, I and a Professor Black, Professor of Classics at the University, um, were given was to defend the bridge with a Stokes mortar, which was a sort of drain pipe uh, on legs. Uh, but the plan was more complicated.